I would like to uh, welcome you to um, Climate Change and Energy Transition uh, uh, panel of the conference uh, 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 for uh, strategies for trans uh, transformative global uh, leadership. Uh, we will discuss uh, one of the significant issues uh, at this panel uh, on uh, how climate change with, will influence energy transition. Uh, recently, we all joined the Paris Agreement, and uh, in that agreement, world governments decided to uh, uh, limit the increase uh, of temperature to uh, significantly less than uh, two degrees, uh, which is something that is uh, 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 that is usually interpreted as 1.5 degrees. Um, I will have um, excellent panelists here with me. Um, one of them is Ernest von Weizsäcker, who is Honorary President of Club of Rome. Uh, he is very long in the area. Uh, then the second one is uh, Natasha Markovska, who is a member of uh, Intergovernmental Panel Climate Change. Uh, then Ian Dunlop, a member of Club of Rome. Uh, and uh, Shir Kilkish, uh, who is lead author uh, of the assessment report number six. Uh, in the beginning, I will give a short introduction, um, and then I will uh, invite uh, four panelists to give initial pitch, five minutes each. Then we will have a discussion on the questions, which we think are important for uh, uh, this topic. And then we will accept uh, questions from the general um, uh, public. So uh, coming back to 1.5 degrees, uh, what do we know now that if we want to keep temperature under 1.5 uh, degrees uh, until the end of uh, uh, century, uh, then we have to globally decrease carbon emissions by 40% uh, by 2030. Uh, which means that in uh, developing countries, we should actually do it by uh, 55 to 60% by 2030. Uh, 2030 is tomorrow. Uh, that means we have to make decisions very quickly. Um, phasing out of coal is fact in uh, many places, in Europe, North America. Um, I hope soon it will uh, become a general rule uh, everywhere, uh, but we have to actually uh, decarbonize most of our power system uh, by 2030. Uh, but we cannot stop at power system only. Uh, we have to look into the heating system, which is uh, uh, using around 40% of final energy uh, in the northern climates, uh, and decarbonizing of heating uh, should generally mean that uh, we cannot really use natural gas, which is a fossil fuel, in the heating system anymore. We should uh, do very fast uh, replacement of uh, natural gas with some other technologies. We have to start, I guess, now. Um, and also, uh, Regarding the transport, we have to see what are the options to quickly replace uh, oil-based internal combustion engines with some other solution. Can we do it? Uh, how to do it? Uh, and what are the barriers? Uh, this is the questions for, uh, for this panel. So as my first speaker, I would like to ask Ernst uh, to take the floor. Thank you very much, Nevin. We have received this global leadership paper in which it begins with the guidelines. Each seminar is meant to go by what they call PAWS Problem Analysis Solutions Strategies. This is also the architecture of a little paper which Nevin and I have been writing a couple of weeks ago, which has been circulated, it's available. The problem is climate. 
I leave that essentially to Ian Dunlop and also to uh, Natasha and Sir, um, and go immediately to the question of analysis and solutions. The analysis has been outlined by Niven for the solutions. Essentially, we have two options or three. First, decarbonize energy, meaning renewable energies instead of coal, etc. Second, reduce the need for energy. Some 10 years ago, together with an Australian team, Ian, uh, I wrote a book called Factor 5, in which we demonstrate that a five-fold increase of energy efficiency is technically available. To more or less illustrate what I'm saying is the following question. I'm asking all my students always. Imagine Mount Everest, very, very tall mountain. Imagine a bucket of water 10 kilograms heavy. How many kilowatt hours would you need to lift that bucket of water to the top of Mount Everest? And the average estimate by the students is something like 100 or 1,000 kilowatt hours. This is totally wrong. You need only one quarter of one kilowatt hour to do it. Meaning a kilowatt hour is a powerhouse. But we treat it as if it was a bloody little nonsense and wasted no end. And this is part of the problem. So we have to learn, this is a technological uh, challenge, to do with a lot less energy, not only solar, because wind and water and all that uh, have their ecological limits. Okay, then strategy. Of course, we need rules, we need standards, but then most importantly, we need prices. Prices have to more or less tell the ecological truth. Today, they are blatantly lying, you know? They do as if they, they, do, they don't cost anything. If we had added the negative uh, effects of coal burning, etc., it would be extremely expensive. Okay. But then there is the north-south problem. The north has already more or less exhausted the budget for damaging the atmosphere. The South has not. This budget approach would force the North to go shopping to developing countries, buying some new permits for every car, for every uh, stove or so they are using to burn, you know. If we install that budget approach, it would become profitable for a country like India or Cameroon or Ecuador to stop building coal power plants. Today, some 500 additional coal power plants are under construction or planned. This has to be stopped if we want uh, to go uh, minus 40% by 2030. So, um, I think this is all I wanted to say, and now we can go on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ernst. Um, now what I would uh, invite uh, Natasha. Natasha, floor is yours. You have uh, a presentation, so uh, share it to us. Can you see the presentation? Not yet. For now, we just see you. And now? Yes. Yes, yes. now it's starting. Yes, and I have to... Maximize it. Maximize it, right. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Nevin. Uh, Thank you all for inviting me in, uh, to be in a, such a 
a competent and nice company to discuss uh, this uh, very important uh, uh, topic and uh, issue which connects uh, energy and climate change uh, in, in the same uh, manner. Uh, so I will uh, provide uh, some views about uh, the issue on, on um, solutions uh, which comes from uh, the, the robust uh, science uh, prepared for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the body, international body, which uh, in a way creates and approves the science, which is the basis upon which the politicians uh, uh, take their decisions about uh, what kind of uh, uh, targets and political solutions uh, will they take in order to address uh, the, this uh, global uh, problem. And upon the findings of this science, in fact, uh, all the underlying uh, goals are uh, somehow found their basis in the in the IPCC science, and it was on the invitation of, on the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, that in October 2018 uh, the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on uh, Climate Change provided a special report on the impacts of uh, global warming of 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels and related uh, global greenhouse gases emission pathways, uh, which are uh, known as 1.5 um, degree pathways or this report SR 1.5. Citing over uh, 6,000 scientific references, um, and using contributions of uh, 91 authors, this report does not only assess what a 1.5 degree warmer world would look like, but also it um, uh, mm, the different pathways by which global temperature rise could be limited to 1.5 uh, degrees is analyzed in this report. Uh, so all of the 1.5 scenarios have global emissions peaking around 2020 and as can be seen in the figure on the, la on the left hand side and uh, dropping to near zero between 2040 and 2060. And again, all of the scenarios have some degree of net negative emissions in the later part of the century. Through the amount, uh, though, though the amount varies between 5 to 32 gigaton CO2 equivalent by the year 2000. And uh, these are the key messages to policymakers. Uh, so to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, Global CO2 emissions must peak and then decline rapidly to net zero. And in addition, negative emissions of some sort are likely to be needed with uh, their scale and nature depending on the other choices. That, was the, that is the first message stemming out of this figure. And the other one is that uh, the, the other result about the temperature is that uh, the temperatures temporarily breach the 1.5 uh, degree uh, limit. This is the second uh, figure on the, right, on the right hand side uh, around mid century and in all 1.5 degree scenarios. Warming reaches between 1.6 and 1.8 eight degrees before falling later in the century as emissions become net negative. All further about the common futures so of the 1.5 degree pathways. Um, it is clear that by mid century CO2 emissions falling uh, to net zero 
with uh, renewables supplying 70% to 85% of electricity and unabated coal use being largely phased out. Also, all 1.5 degree pathways with limited or no overshoot project the use of carbon dioxide removal in the order of 100 to 1,000 tons gigaton CO2 equivalent over the 21st century. And why uh, this uh, carbon dioxide removal is necessary for both moving to net zero emissions and for producing net negative emissions to compensate for any overshoot of 1.5 degrees. But there is a big but here. It must be noted that uh, that that, uh, that uh, carbon dioxide removal deployed at such a scale at the moment is not proven, and poses is a major risk to our ability to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. Then. Uh, about uh, decarbonization of transport and heating sectors, I would note that uh, there is a broad agreement that the global energy system must be increasingly electrified while shifting away from fossil fuels and towards renewables in order to meet the stringent uh, climate goals. So please. Please look uh, at the figure on the left. Today, only 20% of the world's final energy comes from electricity. All of the 1.5 scenarios in the figure show this increasingly rapidly to between 46 and 71% in 2100. This is because it is easier to decarbonize electricity than it is to eliminate emissions uh, from the thousands of small sources burning fossil fuels for space, heating, industry, or for transportation. As mentioned many times, fossil fuels drops dramatically in all 1.5 degrees pathways from around 83% of primary energy as of today to between, uh, to around uh, two and 43% uh, in 2,100, depending on, on the scenarios. Renewables, of course, we have a large shift to them, include solar, wind, and hydro, as well as uh, expanded use of biofuels. And uh, often, the biofuels attached to negative emissions, gathering, uh, get generating biomass with carbon capture and uh, storage. I would like to finish uh, with a national perspective of, of uh, decarbonization, which uh, seen through Macedonian case, the country I come from, is very much similar to the global perspective. Namely, uh, as shown for the latest mitigation analysis conducted in the country for the purpose of the National Energy and Climate Plan, 82% of the emissions in 2030 can be cut compared to 1990 levels in the fall if the following is applied in a timely manner. Renewables plus intensive energy efficiency, definitely phasing out of coal in my country we use uh, most of dominant the role the coal is has a dominant role for electricity generation. Uh, gas maintained the use of gas is maintained only for combined heat and power production in cities and industry. Sector coupling this uh, electrification again at national level of heat and transport sectors and. Uh, more use of district heating and uh, heat pumps, leading again to electrification of heating sector. With that, I would like to finalize my um, intervention. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you, Natasha. The uh, timing was a little bit uh, longer, um, around uh, double. Uh, 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 Ian, floor is yours now. Uh, now we have uh, seen what we have to do. And now let us see what uh, the South thinks, though geographical South, I don't think that Ernest meant uh, by South Australia. Uh, uh, Australia is part of the North from the point of view of uh, climate. So uh, can you um, share your screen? Yes, I will. Whoops. Uh, Natasha, I think you have to... Uh, Unshare yours, yes. Okay, hold on. Okay. Is that okay? I hope we can all say it. Um, well, for my five minutes, I'd just like to give um, uh, perhaps a bit of an unusual view of climate change and where we sit, in the sense um, where, I, as I see it, that we face a far greater urgency for action than is being talked about officially, because the climate position at the moment, I think, represents an immediate existential threat to the future of humanity. And I'd just like to explain why that is in a very short demonstration. Um, firstly, the Paris Climate Agreement, I think we've seen this diagram before. Um, the actual emissions to the left of the diagram, if we want to hit the Paris uh, targets below two degrees C, then those are the lines we have to follow to the right to get down uh, and stay below, in this case, two degrees C, with a 66% chance of doing it. Now, unfortunately, that's the trajectory we're currently on. And if you take the Paris Agreement and you implement everything that was agreed in 2015, that's where we would end up. So we're not dropping emissions at all, which is what we have to do and do it very quickly. We're actually just leveling them off. So the rhetoric between the re rhetoric and reality in Paris, there's a yawning gap. And that's the biggest challenge the world now faces. So I think far more urgent than COVID in many respects. We have to get emissions down extremely quickly. So what does all this mean? Well, we hear a lot of talk. Uh, we've already seen warming of one degree C from the pre-industrial level. The upper limit of Paris is two degrees C, and I would argue that one and a half degrees C is already built into the system, and I'll explain why later. The Paris pathway, if we let it only the current commitments proceed, will end up with three degrees C, quite possibly um, by the middle of the century. And four degrees C is the path we're currently on. Now, one means uh, we're already hitting tipping points in the Arctic and West Antarctic uh, ice sheet. Two means extremely dangerous climate change. We're already hitting dangerous climate change at one degree C. Three, in the opinion of many of the best national security experts around the world, is outright social chaos. And four is incompatible in their eyes with an organized human global community. In other words, global collapse. Now that's the reality, I think, of the path we're currently on. And the average temperature in Australia last year in 2019 was 1.8 degrees C compared with pre-industrial levels. 1.5, we say, well, we have to stay below 1.5. In my view, it's not possible. If you look at any of the uh, modeling that's been done, and this shows the uh, general pathways and the dotted lines here, um, three options of emissions don't peak on the upper lines. If we take the Paris cuts plus later action faster, or, or radical cuts, the two lower lines, 
1.5 degrees C is going to happen by 2030, whatever we do, irrespective of any action that is taken from now on. It's locked in. So the struggle now is to stop things becoming worse and stay below two. And, uh, you know, that's the reality I think we're really facing. If you look at three degrees C, it's quite possible we'll hit three degrees C by 2050. We tend to talk in terms of graphs and models and what have you, but what does it really mean? And these are the sorts of things that we may be facing around the world. This is particularly more focused onto the Asian region in some ways, but ecosystem collapse around the world, deadly heat days above 100 days per annum in many parts of the world, sea level rise uh, certainly greater than 0.5 uh, meters. Many regions becoming uninhabitable, major migration, drop, uh, significant drop in crop yields, and inundation in major agricultural areas, which is part of that. And significant parts of major cities around the world having to be abandoned because of the ingress of seawater. Now, these are the sort of things we're dealing with. We tend not to talk about this. We tend to assume that somehow we'll you know, get to the numbers um, and it'll all be well. But these things are now already happening. The bushfires in Australia, I would argue, are the beginning of perhaps regional or local tipping points. And that's the next big issue because um, if you look at the IPCC work, one of the things that is not included is quantification of the so-called tipping points which are the areas around the world where you might suddenly get a non-linear change in the climate system. I mean, climate doesn't change in a linear sense. You get uh, positive feedback loops. And I mean, this is quite a well-known diagram from the Potsdam Institute of 15 or so of the tipping points around the world that might get triggered in the next few years. And two of those probably already have, have been triggered. Uh, the West Antarctic Ice Sheet and the Arctic Ice Sheet. Now, there are concerns that around nine of those 15 are starting to show signs of moving. And once those uh, are triggered, they become locked in and there's very little we can do about it. And uh, with some of them, it's game over as far as climate is concerned. We will just get into an escalating uh, range of problems. So we really have to treat this with far greater urgency than I think we are now seeing around the world. And these things are not, as I said, quantified in the IPCC works far for good reasons, because it's very hard to quantify them. Uh, we know they're there, but they're not included in the risk assessment and risk is the critical issue on this. So what is the framework we have to move forward with? Well, I'd suggest the following that we have to accept that this represents an immediate existential threat to human civilization. The threat is immediate in the sense that we are now locking in those types of problems for tipping points by continuing to commit to fossil fuel investment. I mean, with all the good talk around the world, we are spending far more on fossil fuels at the moment than we are on renewables. And that has been the case for the last decade. We require fundamentally different approaches to the governance and risk management of climate change from anything we've seen in conventional risk management practice, which means you have to say, we have a target, we're here today, we have to get there tomorrow, and we have to take every possible option to do it. There is no choice. It's not a question of what is politically feasible. It's a question of how do we do this? We've done it before, you do it in wartime situations uh, when you have a very clear threat. And I don't particularly like using the wartime analogy, but that is the type of approach you really have to use. The only way now, in my view, of avoiding irreversible climate change is if we have rapid carbon emission reductions by a small number of the largest state and corporate emitters, maybe the top 10 or 12, you know, 10 or 12 emitters, whether they be countries or companies. We have to get agreement that that now has to happen. It's the only way that we're going to pull emissions down quickly enough. The other things we're all talking about, extremely important technology changes, community action, but they're not going to deliver the speed and extent of the required reduction 
if we're serious about staying below two degrees C. And that means that all fossil fuel expansion must stop now and the industry wound back. I mean, if you're in this situation, it is pointless continuing to build new fossil fuel projects, whether it's, you know, coal, gas or oil. And at the same time, expect uh, the community and the technology uh, industries and so on to be racing to find solutions. I mean, it's completely incompatible. So we have to accept that that is the reality. And that means emergency action in the way you, you, you do act, as I said, in a, in a wartime situation. So the idea that the net zero emissions by 2050 is realistic is fact, in my view, quite wrong. This is what people are now locking into. They're saying, you know, if we achieve this, then we're in good shape. I would suggest that is completely incorrect. And it is just brushing under the carpet the real implications of climate risk. So that's what we have to, I think we really have to reframe the um, argument in those immediate emergency terms and start talking realistically about the way forward from here. So I'll leave it at that. Um, there are, if uh, people are interested in the um, background to this, you'll find it in some of the Club of Rome work and in some of the work that uh, the small think tank I work with has been doing over the last few years. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, you were also a bit more than uh, five minutes, around 10 minutes, but uh, uh, oh, thank you for uh, excellent insight into uh, the climate issue. And um, I would like to invite now uh, Sheer Kilkish to uh, take over the floor. Thank you very much for the invitation to join such an important panel. Let me begin by emphasizing that ensuring the protection of planetary life support systems is at the center of all that we should aim for. In contrast, atmospheric CO2 concentrations continue to increase and one slot more probable for a three degree scenario, multiple tipping points from the West Antarctic ice sheet to the thawing of permafrost can also be exceeded in two degree and even 1.5 degree scenarios. And all of these tipping points are connected. Currently, constant emissions for the next eight years will entirely consume the remaining carbon budget for a 1.5 degree scenario. We need to flatten the curve with Herculean reductions. And this needs to go much beyond to two degree in which starting reductions this year will require a continued mitigation rate of 6% each year. In comparison, the forced confinement during COVID resulted in less than a 10% reduction in total emissions when measured for four months. This further underlines the need for systemic transformation for sustained reductions. The rates of change can vary according to different modeling results, with this one adapted from a global study for 100% renewable energy by the year 2050. Major increases in the share of renewable energy throughout the next 30 years are necessary across all sectors, not to mention greater increases in the upcoming years. As renewable energy targets, Currently, about 50 countries have targets for renewable heating, cooling, and transport, and 170 countries for renewable energy and power, but with various ambitions and timescales. So how can systemic transformation be supported from a policy perspective? Can we design and implement policy instruments that can have a key role for decarbonization better? Can we implement additional policies, such as an exergy tax and an exergy improvement factor incentive in supporting the renewable energy transition? Boundaries can also influence how we evaluate options. The broader our view, the greater the possibilities to capture missed opportunities of energy resource not being used, wasted, and even curtailed. Power to X options also have a great role in increasing system flexibility in renewable energy systems and supporting factor five improvements for resource productivity, including from an energy perspective. Paradigm shifts in parameters that we use to measure progress are also important here, the useful work potential or exergy in low temperature district heating applications per unit of energy is calculated across various case studies. When compared to the unit exergy of conventional energy source, the use of low temperature district heating can represent an average exergy improvement factor of 7.1 across the case studies. A paradigm shift is also necessary to reverse the drivers of urban emissions, particularly through integrating urban energy planning 
Since 1990, urban emissions have been increasing in different parts of the world, reaching to about 23 gigatons of CO2 emissions in recent years, according to this data. Reversing these trends will require solutions combining sufficiency, efficiency, flexibility, renewable energy, and more sustainable urbanization. How will the future evolve? Different pathways, namely shared socioeconomic pathways or SSPs, have put, ha, are been put forth from SSP1 that represents taking a green road to others with different challenges for mitigation and adaptation. These narrative frameworks also relate to different increases in both urban land expansion and changes in total population as we see in these figures. Limiting urban land expansion and ensuring that per capita emissions are limited with sustainable solutions will be crucial for navigating to more sustainable options. To make an additional point, when we question what has led to increased well-being, one way of which can be measured by uh, measuring life expectancy, increase in income does not have as much as a role. It is actually residential energy use that had the greatest percentage in statistically accounting for increase in life expectancy. When we think about the future, we must also completely realize that greater well-being and the renewable energy transition to decouple sufficient energy use from emissions go hand in hand, including new job opportunities. Addressing the climate emergency requires a renewable energy transition for the benefit of the planet of which we are also part. Clearly, we need rapid action in all of the societal systems from multiple dimensions. This includes enabling sustainable urban systems in support of the renewable energy transition. From integrated urban energy planning to reduce CO2 emissions per capita, we can increase well-being while protecting planetary life support systems. These are my initial statements for the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shir, for staying in uh time schedule. Um, I will now um, uh, uh, try to uh, move towards uh, the panel questions. And uh, my first question is uh, what we need uh, for 1.5 degrees in energy sector and when. And what we have seen from uh, Ian presentation uh, and also from Natasha presentation is that uh, uh, we cannot uh, manage one, get 1.5 uh, Cs uh, uh, now uh, because we are going to breach that uh, anyway in a few years time. Um, but when we talk about uh, Paris Agreement, we are thinking about uh, 2100, which Natasha has shown, and that with very rapid transition, uh, energy transition, uh, we can make it until the end of the century. But for sure, by 2025, we are going to breach it. Um, we have seen uh, solutions, and I fully agree with uh, Ernst's position that uh, energy efficiency uh, can actually significantly reduce uh, emissions. Uh, our models are showing that if we move towards uh, renewable energy, towards electrification of transport and heating, uh, we reduce the primary energy need uh, for 50% because of energy efficiency. Electric vehicles, uh, they mean five times less, four to five times less primary energy. Um, electric heating or district heating also means two to four times less energy, more energy efficiency. So, um, uh, uh, but we have to do, in my opinion, uh, the transition all at once, uh, not waiting for something to happen to start with transition in heating and the uh, transport sector. Uh, what do you think, uh, 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 how should we start uh, with this process uh, of energy transition? Uh, uh, Ian mentioned that we should stop investing in fossil fuel. Um, I agree on that, but this is not a simple thing because uh, we also want to avoid too much stranded cost. Uh, so what are your take uh, on that? Maybe uh, uh, we can start with Ernst. Thank you. I start with a psychological thing. In most countries of the world, we have a strong 
conservative right-wing movement against climate protection. In uh, Poland, in uh, much of the Rust Belt of America, it is a majority of people who fiercely want to stop uh, climate protection, you know? This is the problem. Technical answers don't impress them. They don't want it. They hate it. Period. So, what can we do there? I got a manuscript of a new book by James Powell, which is called 2084, where a climate scientist looks back into the 2020s or so and asks his, um, I mean, in, in the literature, he asks, have they not known in 2020 how horrendous the effects of global warming would be? I mean, Ian Dunlop has described the whole thing. And then the answer is, no, no, they knew it, but they didn't want it. And then the book goes through 15 different chapters, one more horrendous than the other. If we make that a best-selling book, you would see the next uh, parliamentary elections shifting dramatically towards what we need to do. It seems that in Germany they are shifting uh, towards green uh, positions, but uh, it will be very difficult to put it uh, in many other countries. I agree with you uh, very much. But uh, what I see as an optimistic uh, uh, solution to that problem is that renewables are becoming uh, uh, bigger and bigger business, and that uh, starts to create renewables as uh, lobbies and then they are uh, managing to find better and better fossil lobbies so we are kind of equalizing uh, 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 in a, in a, in a sh uh, relatively long distance uh, 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 this disbalance uh, 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 other panelists would you like to comment on this uh, uh, threshold how to start uh, uh, with the change. Uh, Sheer. Uh, it's also a messaging issue. So um, as stated by in, in the panel, if we treat this as an emergency, uh, we saw this very clearly uh, in, in COVID. Uh, it was treated as a crisis and the earlier actions uh, was able to see uh, better results. Same with climate change. The earlier action that is taken, uh, we can have better results. So it is uh, a messaging issue that needs close um, support uh, from scientific community as tried to be done with IPCC, but also uh, with this governance from all levels, uh, from national to cities uh, to, to civil society. We need to be very clear on how this is messaged so the, uh, the, the renewable energy transition can be supported even more. Thank you. Natasha? Uh, I was also ju just want to support that uh, this is a matter of lobby and psychological issue and uh, uh, with the maturity of uh, low carbon technologies and processes we have an additional argument in hand because uh, we can market uh, low carbon development based uh, on the economic analysis and uh, uh, I can talk about uh, the latest analysis from my country we have 60% uh, of uh, low carbon development measures are with negative costs. So compared to our reference scenarios, when if we, if we go further with uh, current policies and uh, we have a scenario which is much cheaper uh, than uh, uh, the carbonization scenario is much cheaper than uh, uh, fossil fuel based scenario. So this is another argument in hand to use in marketing the decarbonization pathways over the fossil fuel base. Thank you. Thank you. Ian, do you want to add something? Yes? Yes, thank you. Um, I think we are at a quite an unusual point. I mean, Ernst's comment I think is perfectly correct. There's been enormous resistance 
to accepting the realities of climate change because we've essentially had a world that's grown rich, at least some parts of the world, not all, on fossil fuels. The people who run those industries have gained enormous political power and that's not something they want to give up terribly readily. Now, it's very hard, I think, for people who've been in an industry for 50 years and it's always grown and it's always uh, had, I guess, it's uh, hands on the levers of power to accept they're going to have to give way to other alternatives. But I think what's happening is that if you look at the pandemic, um, we must realize that all these things are linked. I mean, as populations increased, as economic growth has increased, as the Club of Rome work back in the uh, 70s, the limits of growth uh, highlighted, we were getting, going to get into problems and we, we are because the encroachment of humanity into natural areas, the uh, destruction of the biosphere and biodiversity, all of these things are starting to result in events that we didn't, well, we should have expected, we were warned, like the pandemic, which comes from in part climate change because of the, uh, the increasing temperatures, the, the pressures on people to move into these natural areas and so on. So we've suddenly realized that we now have a genuine existential threat in the sense of this pandemic. Um, we've also suddenly discovered that we can actually do things that people previously believed completely impossible. In other words, we are now moving away from free market economics we're using Keynesian stimulus measures to prop up economies. It's clearly perfectly obvious that the private sector, um, as it's currently constituted economically, is incapable of handling a problem like the pandemic. And so we have a role for governments, which previously was not thought to be there, or at least the, uh, the conventional wisdom in the Western world, not in every part of the world, certainly, was that the role of government was diminishing. Now, we at the same time are finding that the cost of the transition is now to a low carbon world is actually much lower than it used to be. So these factors have all come together and it provides I think a completely different context uh, to make the transition extremely quickly provided we recognize risk. And the problem with a lot of this debate is that we have never really understood what the risks of climate change are. Um, I think scientifically, for various reasons, they have been downplayed. Um, in things like the tipping point issue, they're not quantified for often good reasons. But the mm. fact is those risks are there and it's now becoming clear from the events around the world that these things are happening. I mean, we've seen it in Australia in the last um, you know, years. Okay. If you look um, at, maybe. just to finish off, if you look at okay. Northern Europe now in Siberia, what is going to happen to the Russian oil industry as permafrost starts to melt? We're already mm -hmm. seeing some problems. So we have to use this opportunity to, I think, uh, develop a constructive way forward where all of the parties can start coming together, recognizing that we have now circumstances which are a threat to everybody. So we need far greater global cooperation than we've ever seen before. And of course, unfortunately at the moment, we have leaders who are not demonstrating that. Uh, yes, um, well, uh, on the question of um, uh, the speed of transition, I have a good example of uh, Brazilian state of Rio Grande do Norte, which in four years managed to increase share of wind from zero to 260%. Uh, and no technical problem happened. Uh, so we should uh, start uh, helping those cases that want to do the transition. Um, you have also the case of uh, Elon Musk in electric car, uh, which looked like a joke 10 years ago, but uh, today uh, it's the most valuable car company. The smart money is on Musk, and the rest of the fossil fuel cars are dead. Uh, and they now know if they want to survive, they have to quickly 
get out with electric cars. And most probably they will not survive because they don't know how to do electric cars. But, Nevin, so uh, the transition can be very quick. Most of the electricity comes from coal. Well, in some countries like Australia, yes. But in Europe, it's relatively renewable already. Uh, I mean, compared to what, China, India, South Africa, yes, etc. it's so, true. But even if electricity uh, alone is not the answer, sorry, electricity alone is not the answer because you have okay. to say where the electricity comes from. Uh, yes, I fully agree on that. But we are fast now decarbonizing power sector. Uh, and uh, uh, I think we cannot wait for the power sector to be uh, fully renewable uh, to start with the electrification of other sectors because well, then no, we are too late. I mean, we a little bit of electricity, be... but uh, don't forget the efficiency point and the massive increase of renewables. Otherwise, electricity doesn't help. Yes, I agree. But uh, electric car is four times more efficient than internal combustion engine. So by uh, switching to electric car, even if you're using coal electricity, uh, you are staying on the same level. But if you move to wind and solar electricity, you are four times better. Uh, so it can actually be done. But on the other hand, we have, according to International Monetary Fund, subsidies in the amount of $4,000 billion per year. Uh, uh, that's a problem. And why can't we talk about that? When I start this issue of subsidies, they, they uh, say, where are the subsidies? Of course, they're hidden. Bravo, that's the right point. <laughs> yes. So we have to work how to remove those subsidies. But it seems it's very difficult because of the reasons you mentioned. So, uh, uh, can we start uh, attacking technologies uh, that have no future, like f uh, 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 heating on, um, on gas? If we look at the energy uh, districts, uh, it's clearly point pointing into district heating and heat pumps, but we are still selling uh, gas boilers. Well, what do you think about these new technologies? You know, I don't see them being taken in uh, quickly. We also have a question from the public, which I would like to join, is how to do it in Africa, because uh, uh, the electric cars are still expensive. Do you have uh, a take on that, uh, 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 how to do it quickly enough? Now we know that in, developing in developed countries, uh, cars are going to be electric. What to do with the developing one? I don't in know. China, uh, which is the champion of electric cars, the inventor of the electric cars is now saying this is the second best. We have to move to hydrogen. What about hydrogen? What do you think? What is the role of hydrogen in the whole transition process? It's fantastic. We need to expand it. But, of course, also hydrogen doesn't grow on trees. It has to be manufactured. And so the origin of the hydrogen economy must be renewables. Okay, but uh, that is, um, in a way, against your energy efficiency uh, uh, or, or no, no, as, uh, as the most important thing, because hydrogen is not very energy efficient. Uh, it is not less efficient than electricity is. It's I don't agree. Um, I have um, um, calculated, and um, it looks like uh, we need uh, 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 maybe five to ten times more primary energy if we do heating with hydrogen or e fuels than with uh, electricity. Can you explain uh, how do we heat with, uh, 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 with, with uh, hydrogen? Heating is mostly wasteful. I'm living in a so-called passive house, which essentially needs no heating, period. Yes, I fully agree on that point. Uh, we should definitely go towards uh, 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 nearly zero energy buildings. Yeah. Uh, but 
this is something that will take uh, uh, a very long period of time uh, so we can't really do that uh, uh, quickly and we still have to do some heating of the left uh, uh, remaining of the buildings so this is how much electricity we need uh, to heat Europe 1.6 petawatt hours and this is how much we need if we do it using uh, uh, hard, uh, 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 hydrogen based uh, uh, synthetic fuels. It's quite inefficient way in my uh, opinion. You are perfectly right. Heating is almost a sin, but we can do architecture and design that heating more or less disappears from the energy budget. Yes, but, but it will happen only if prices tell the truth. The yes, okay. With these subsidies, which you correctly mentioned, is intended to make energy cheap, and that is the sin. As long as it's cheap, we need a lot of heating uh, power. You know? Uh, maybe to show, we can, we can ask... Uh, Sheer about that because she is uh, um, a lead author on the on the subject of uh, cities. Yeah. So uh, Sheer. Uh, so cities have an opportunity uh, to direct direct the investments and to avoid the lock-in. So even if uh, our renewable uh, electricity is not 100% renewable now, investing in uh, transport options that have the electricity will be able will enable us to more quickly transition and to avoid additional lock-in to um, uh, um, inefficient and uh, carbon-intensive forms of transport. So um, uh, as much as possible, we can accelerate the uh, electrification of transport and in the meantime, increasing the renewable energy share in the entire uh, power sector. This will be a good uh, strategy to follow. And on the question on Africa, um, we can also broaden thinking about different finance mechanisms. Um, different finance mechanisms for uh, community financing or um, uh, uh, crowdsource financing or different uh, alternatives. Uh, there's more than one. So maybe in that case, uh, what can be different alternatives uh, while increasing the investments into also making the leap uh, in Africa in the transport sector. Uh, so we need to uh, ensure that also the global south uh, is able to leapfrog uh, in these technologies. Uh, with the question of um, heating and decarbonization of heating, for too long of a time, we have talked about layered policies. We support this and we also support that. Uh, but currently we're seeing that uh, policies that are uh, removing or, or trying to uh, ban uh, certain uh, inefficient technologies, this, this is the way to go because time is very limited. Uh, so if we are able to um, uh, direct policies into uh, the right direction um, and not trying to support everything at the same time, but actually limiting uh, what would lock in additional uh, CO2 emissions. This could be an effective way uh, considering the limited time ahead of us. Thank you. Um, I think we have um, uh, spent the time for a panel discussion. Um, I would like to invite uh, attendees to uh, put questions uh, under questions and answer. Um, we already kind of answered two questions and I have uh, uh, one more question which is from Tobias Orton, uh, which is about the role of uh, bioeconomy. Uh, uh, he thinks that uh, we need um, uh, uh, area for production of food and we should not uh, lean so much on a bioeconomy. We should be careful uh, how we use area. But uh, uh, can we actually do it without uh, bioeconomy? What about uh, bioraffineries and uh, plastics? Uh, how can we uh, fully decarbonize economy without bioeconomy? That's uh, a question. Any of the panelists can... Uh, answer that? Yes. I mean, from the point of view of biodiversity, the so-called bioeconomy is stupid. It destroys wild areas, the last remains for wildlife. 
Okay, uh, Ian wanted to, um, to talk, to answer that question also. Yeah, look, I, I think uh, you have to be very careful with, um, I think, the, the bioeconomy. I mean, the question of land availability and the way we're going to use it with an increasing population is going to be becoming, uh, you know, more and more a concern. So we have to be quite realistic about um, the trade-offs between food and, um, you know, <clears throat> bioenergy and what have you. And particularly some of these ideas on negative emission technologies, because uh, they could potentially become extremely um, cons consumptive of, of land areas and so on. On the other hand, you have a lot of um, potentially very attractive sequestration options in terms of increasing soil carbon around the world, increasing agricultural productivity and what have you, if it's, if it's done properly. Um, but I think with all of these technologies, I mean, there are big question marks in virtually everything you look at. What it really needs is a, is a coming together of the best possible expertise we can get within a policy framework that recognizes the, the real risk implications of what we now have to address. And I don't think we've got that in any country in the world at this point in time. I mean, we really are going to, uh, particularly in, in, you know, countries like Africa, in African countries and so on. We need to find, we need to find ways and means of getting that expertise uh, dispersed around the world. And each country will be different. And there, there isn't, you know, one size fit all. It's going to be very uh, different depending on the circumstances that each country has. So we, I don't, I mean, there's a, a tremendous amount of um, noise, I guess, around technologies and what's coming to the fore and what isn't, and whether one is better than the other. But what it lacks is a context, and the context has to be risk, and how fast you've got to move, and how, how you can put these things together um, in an integrated sense to come up with the, the sort of overall solutions we need in terms of emission reduction, as well as maintaining uh, the economies of society in a sustainable manner. And that's a much bigger picture, I think, than um, you know, we've tended to accept so far. Uh, we have um, come to um, the time of uh, ending the panel, but uh, before we end it, um, I would like uh, that uh, panelists give a final thought, uh, up to a minute uh, each. Who is going to uh, take the opportunity first? Let's start the other direction this time with Shir. Okay, so Shir. So uh, a big focus of our discussion has been how and how fast, and I think the answer to that is as um, quickly as possible, as bold as possible, and trying to align the right policies, the right metrics, the right parameters with the um, effective governance structures and uh, the options that are available to us, uh, both by behavioral structural change and supporting this and using all of this to support the renewable energy transition. Uh, so in final thoughts, um, we need to uh, accelerate as much as possible, use also cities to accelerate the transition. Uh, also on the demand side and the supply side, uh, cities have a lot of solutions to offer, including uh, district energy options and uh, more efficient public transport options. And uh, so we need to use all the opportunities that we have and to accelerate this transition because time is very, very limited. Thank you. Ian? Okay, well, I think we are, as I said, at a, a completely um, unique point in human history where a number of things have come together to wake us up to the fact that we are now facing um, completely unexpected risks. We have got to have more global cooperation than we've ever seen before. And the world at the moment is going in the opposite direction. Now, what we need is uh, a bottom-up pressure from the community to pick up on those points and recognize that it's in everybody's interest now to move forward on these issues far faster than we've seen. And that pressure, we need leaders also who can accept that. But I think in the end, it's going to be civil society that is now going to create that pressure and get leaders to start picking up on 
reality of climate risk. What the, the positive point, I think, is we now have the technologies to do that. And they are, in many cases, more economic than maintaining the status quo. Thank you. Natasha? Uh, most of my thoughts were taken from the previous uh, uh, speakers. I would say we should go for smart energy systems, uh, with smart solutions, uh, which will enable uh, integration, 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 and, uh, you know, sector coupling, electrification. And uh, the remaining part uh, of what uh, which, uh, the things which cannot be electrified, uh, then we have to go with uh, um, uh, biomass or other uh, technologies which will include a lot of efficiency. That's it from my side. Smart Thank you. the energy. Thank you. Uh, Ernst? Let me only add that those climate friendly technologies have to become profitable. They are not now, or only exceptionally. And we have to stabilize population in the world. It is completely mad if population is growing. Thank you. Thank you, all panelists. Um, well, I would uh, like to conclude that uh, uh, most of us uh, agree that uh, techno-economically we have now solutions, but uh, the barriers are mostly in uh, uh, lobbies, uh, subsidies, uh, psychology, and we have to fight uh, those things and uh, open the space for uh, people that uh, can implement uh, transition quickly because we need it extremely quickly now uh, in order to save the climate. Uh, thank you very much uh, to everyone, to the attendees and panelists, and uh, I would like to close this session now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Janani, you can now stop recording. Okay. Thank you. We will do that. And could we close the webinar as well? Uh, yes, you can close the webinar. Uh, maybe you can leave uh, panelists uh, for a few minutes just to, uh, uh -huh. to have a final word. I, uh, I think we will not be able to stop the broadcast, so... Okay, okay, so let's close it. Thank you uh, again. Yes, you're welcome. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.